Hello, and welcome to Ellis Library. I'm Kelly Hansen. I'm head of Special Collections, and I'm here to introduce you to this tutorial, which will help you uh, get oriented to your session in the classroom. So what is Special Collections? We are part of the library that takes care of the old, rare, fragile, unique, and just plain strange items. What you'll see in your session will depend on your class subject, but we have everything from 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablets to 21st century artist books. We also share a reading room and some storage space with the university archives, who take care of the official records of the university, as well as private papers and other documents related to the history of the university and the university community. We're always really excited to have students in the classroom, and so we hope you use this tutorial to make the most of your visit to Special Collections. Hello, my name is John Henry Adams, and I am a Special Collections Librarian. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the rules in the classroom. So whenever we use Special Collections materials, we are borrowing them from the future, and we have to keep them in as good shape as possible. And as a general rule of thumb, you can always think about it as, well, if I were 200 or 300 years old, how would I want to be treated? And so the general rules are, one, you need to wash and dry your hands thoroughly. Clean, dry hands are the best way to handle most special collections materials. Also, only one person at a time should be handling the object at, under examination. Right? If you've got two people, it's very easy for one of you to make a move the other one doesn't expect, and that's how things get damaged. Similarly, we do not allow food, gum, drinks, or pens in the, in the classroom. It's very easy for those kinds of things to accidentally leave a mark on some of our materials. And like I said, we're borrowing them from the future. And then this is something that's easy to forget, but it's surprising how easy it is to forget. Always leave your pencils down when you are handling the objects. It's very easy to forget, oh, I have a pencil in my hand, and that's how stray marks happen. If you need to borrow a pencil or loose paper, we can easily provide that for you while you're here. And then finally, photographs. Please take photographs. You know, anything that you want to do photographically, that's fine. Just don't take a picture with a flash. That's all that we ask. Okay, so let's get started. All right. Let's start with books. Most of our collection is, after all, the Codex book like this. This is the Mort to Arthur, printed in the early 20th century at the Shakespeare's Head Press. And the first thing that you're going to notice is that I have put the book into a cradle. That means that it's going to be fully supported throughout. That's very important. Don't ever pick up a book while it's being handled. Second sort of point that I'd like to to address is because this book is very old, it doesn't want to open all the way. And that's because books are not designed to be opened flat. And so always keep it, um, let the book decide how far open it wants to go. And let's suppose that you came to this passage here and you wanted to take a photograph or take some notes, but you didn't want to keep your hand on the book. That's perfectly acceptable. So what we're going to ask that you do then is you're going to use a book weight like this one. And then you can take your notes, you can take your photograph, and everything is fine. Speaking of which, um, you'll notice that I'm always handling the book one page at a time. That's because although parchment and paper are surprisingly tough, at least until we reach the mid-19th century, they are still delicate. They can easily be torn. And so by handling pages one at a time, we can avoid that. I'm also always touching it from the outer edge. Grabbing it from the gutter or the middle of the page is not good. It's, that's how you tear things. And then the second thing is I'm always keeping my hand at the outermost corners because there's no ink there. And ink is only on top of the page. It's not part of it. And so it's very easy for it to rub off. Even the toughest ink will eventually fade if you handle it. So never touch the printed portion or the written portion of the text block, always touch it where the page is blank. So the same rules that apply to the large book also apply to less artistically challenged books, like this one. This is um, Ultimate Spider-Man, which is Miles Morales' second solo outing. And it's the one in which Peter Parker comes back, although I don't know why their encounter looks super aggressive here. They, they're not enemies. As before, you're always going to want to touch the book at the outer edge, 
where there's the least chance of there being ink, although comic books have a tendency to print all the way to the edge of the page. So you're going to want to be delicate, and you're always going to want to reach for the outer corner. Other than that, it's basically the same rules. Handle the book delicately, one page at a time, from the edges, and you'll be fine. Scrolls are a form of book from before the time of the codex. And as such, they have a few quirks all their own. Now this is a facsimile of the book of Esther, also called The Scroll. Um, and the original is, this is a facsimile, the original is uh, from the 18th century. It's currently held at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. So, just like with a book, you always want to avoid touching the colored portion of a scroll. And, that, and because scrolls may want to roll themselves back up, you always are going to want to keep, keep them under control. That may mean that you have to use a book weight to keep them open, or you may have to do it manually depending on how long you're working with it. Scrolls are great for working in teams for this reason. Some of the things that we have in the collection are quite strange, and so one of them is this wooden flute. We want to be careful with it. Um, we might leave it on a foam support, or we might leave it on the table. Just be delicate with it, and please, I know it's tempting, but do not play the flute, or do not try to. We also have this book, which is one of the quirkier things that we have. It is made of concrete shapes. And it is quite quirky. One thing to keep in mind is, although it's concrete, that doesn't mean that it can't be damaged. And they are a little bit heavier than you would expect, not much heavier, but a little bit. So you're always going to want to make sure that when you're handling these things, that you have as good a grip as you can and that you are careful as you work with them. We also have a number of single sheet items. They are maps, decals, posters, anything you can think of that's on a single sheet of paper. Um, we'll start over here with this map. This is uh, from the very first atlas printed in the West, the Teatrum Orbis Terrarum by Abraham Ortelius. Um, it's from the 16th century. It is, as you can see, a piece of paper with some ink on the front of it. So as always, touch it in the corners if you need to. Although with a lot of our single sheet items, you don't have to do any, you don't have to touch them because they don't have anything on the back side. This poster is from the 1920s, and it is a tourism poster for Germany. You'll notice that it has been encapsulated in mylar. This is a protective plastic coating that is sealed all the way around the edge, and that will protect the poster. It gives it a little more stability. You're still going to want to prioritize touching it at the corners not on the page itself, not on, and certainly not on the printed material. Some of our posters have things on both sides. If you needed help moving a very, very large poster, and we have much bigger ones than would fit on frame, then you might need to ask somebody for help. But otherwise, just handle it carefully, and we're good. We also have individual leaves from books, a lot of them from the Middle Ages. This right here is a 15th century Bohemian Bible leaf from the tail end of the Book of Leviticus. And it is written on parchment, but we've encapsulated it in mylar for its protection, just to give it that little extra stuff. Again, avoid touching any of the spaces that have ink on them in particular, and if you can, just touch the mylar. And then this, it's not just manuscripts that we have, we also have printed books like that, or printed leaves, rather. And this is from a very famous book, whose title I'm not going to mangle by trying to pronounce it. And it was produced by Aldus uh, Minutius, who is a very, very prominent and important 15th century Venetian printer. Special Collections also has a number of archival collections, which are stored in special boxes like this, either small boxes like this, or a large one like this. These are both from the V.T. Hamlin collection. V.T. Hamlin was a cartoonist who created a strip in 1932 called Alley Oop, which is still running today. Whenever an item gets pulled out of one of these folders, we always mark its place with a flag like this, and we only ever take one item at a time. And the idea here is to make sure that the order of the materials is preserved, because they've all been organized very carefully. 
Whenever you're handling an archival collection like this, you always want to treat it as though it is a book that can be opened flat. So here we have the strips. That means we still touch by the corner. We handle it very delicately, and we flip it over like this as though they were pages of a book. That way, when we close this folder, we'll be able to go everything, we'll be able to go back to the way things were before. Everything will be in the same order that it was and facing the same direction. And that means that these initial sketches will all be facing the same way that they were when we were done. We also have very large books. This is the Nuremberg Chronicle from the year 1493. It's one of my personal favorites. Um, and it is particularly famous because of its many large woodcuts. So you can see them here, the creation of the world um, and the, the general cosmos. One of the things that you'll notice is that I've put an extra foam here that's to provide additional support because a book this size is going to put a lot of strain on its hinges when it's opened and therefore you're going to want to be extra careful. And as you can see, its reputation is well deserved. What we have here is a book by the 17th century Jesuit, Jeremias Drexel. And it is a collection of two of his religious works. And as you can see, it is quite small. It is so small, in fact, that we've opted not to use a foam cradle, but to use this special one. And small books have a tendency to want to stay closed. And so we have to be very delicate. We have to hold it open while we're working with it. And a really, really bo small book, you might even have to hold it in your hand while you work with it. But we prefer, if possible, as it is with this book, that it remain in the cradle. Some of you may have noticed that up until this point, I have not been wearing gloves. That's because gloves and rare books don't mix very well. Gloves reduce your tactile sensitivity. They make it that much easier to damage the books. However, people often assume that we're going to want you to wear them because it looks good on TV, right? Clean, you know, you've got that cleanliness, it's fancy, it shows that you're very, being very careful. But like I said, tactile sensitivity goes down and therefore you're much more likely to actually damage something if your hands are gloved. Clean, dry hands is, the, is your best tool. That said, there are a few items that we have in the collection where we would ask you to wear gloves. And so now let's talk about those. There are five things that you would have to be careful about. Photographs. Photographs are actually very, very delicate. They are extremely sensitive to the oils in the human skin. And if you are handling photographs, you should absolutely wear gloves. You should also do your best to handle them just from the edges. Again, ink is not part of this. It's on top of this, and it can easily be removed. And these specific photographs come from Jim Gossage. They are an addendum to our Lanford Wilson collection. Ivory or bone. Um, ivory and bone are both very porous, and so they have a tendency to absorb oils from the skin and they will discolor. And therefore, you should always wear gloves whenever you're handling ivory materials, such as this little mannequin of a pregnant lady from the 18th century. She may have been a teaching tool. She may have just been a curiosity owned by a wealthy doctor, but she does have the perk that we can look at all of her organs. And we need to be very careful with her because we'd like to keep her in as good a condition as we can. Metal. Many metals, and especially the kinds of metals that we're likely to get in special collections, tarnish. Um, and the, the touch of oils and salts from your fingers could easily discolor them and damage them. Um, and therefore, we ask that you wear gloves when you handle such things. This right here is a sign um, from the Sincere Company in Guangdong, China. It might be the same as the Sincere department store chain that still exists there today. The other um, caveat that you might have is sometimes we'll have a book with a metal cover, and so you might consider wearing gloves when you open that book, but you should not wear gloves while you're handling the pages themselves. Unglazed ceramics. So these are the oldest things that we have in the library. They are 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablets. 
They are made of unglazed ceramic. And unglazed ceramics will absorb moisture if they are given the chance, and that will help them break down. So we don't want to do that. And we typically don't handle these at all. We just leave them in their box for people to admire. If you were to handle these or any kind of unglazed ceramic, you would absolutely want to wear gloves to protect the kitneiform and the ceramics from the moisture in your hands. Poison. So in the 19th century, poisonous metals like arsenic and chromium were sometimes used to produce green dyes. And if you were to handle a poisonous book, you should absolutely wear gloves to protect yourself. Ask your librarian if a book is poisonous. You might also have to wear gloves if you are performing open heart surgery or if you are waiting on Lord and Lady Grantham at table. But these rarely come up in special collections. Just remember that those are the five situations where you might have to wear gloves. If you're handling photographs, if you're handling ivory or bone, if you're handling metal, if you're handling unglazed ceramics, or if you're handling a poisonous object. Other than that, clean, dry hands is the best way that you can take it. We're excited to have you come and visit us in the classroom. And please, if you see anything you want to see more of, or if you have any questions, come and visit us. The only requirement is your own curiosity.